Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to today's show. This is Jason Hartman, your host. And as you may or may not know, every 10th show, we kind of do a special tradition here that originated with my Creating Wealth show, where we do a topic that is actually off topic on purpose, something just to do with general life and more successful living. And that's exactly what we're going to do today with our special guest. Again, 10th show is off topic, and it is very much intentional just for personal and Richmond, and I hope you enjoy today's show. And we will be back with our guest in just a moment. It's my pleasure to welcome Doug Conant to the show. He is the author of Touch Points, and he's got some amazing insights that may seem rather obvious to most people. However, uh, there are always new ways that we can apply them and be more effective in life and leadership. And I think you'll hear a real transformative message here today. Doug, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Well, thank you for having me. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Well, give us a little bit uh, of information about your background, and then let's dive into touch points. Well, uh, my background is really, uh, I've come up in the corporate world. I had uh, less than two years ago, I retired after over 10 years as, uh, as chief executive officer of the Campbell Soup Company. Prior to that, I spent a career in consumer products with uh, General Mills, Kraft, and Nabisco and wrapped up my career uh, with Campbell Soup Company in Camden, New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia. Along the way, I've been uh, heavily involved in all kinds of corporate activity, but a lot of nonprofit activity. So uh, my focus today is, and my focus going forward, quite frankly, is all about helping to improve the quality of leadership in the 21st century, sharing my experiences and trying to encourage people to lean into the notion of being more effective as as leaders in everyday life. And your your tenure at Campbell's Soup as CEO started in 2001, correct? Yes, January 8th, 2001. Seems like yesterday. <laughs> but it's actually quite a few years ago. Campbell's is such an iconic brand, you know, for uh, well over 100 years, you know, of history. Were there any big challenges when you came aboard? I haven't followed the history of that company too much. But what were what were some of the things? And, and you probably incorporated them into the Touchpoints book and philosophy, I assume. Yes, uh, a lot of the thinking that's captured in our uh, book, Touchpoints, was uh, was was born out of my experience at Campbell Soup Company. Campbell Soup Company is an iconic company. It's about ten billion dollars in sales with twenty thousand employees, uh, products sold in one hundred and twenty countries, and uh, uh, we were uh, very committed to uh, having an enduring business proposition with our company. It was over one hundred and forty years old. Only had eleven CEOs over those one hundred and forty years. I was the eleventh. And uh, it was a troubled company. We had lost half our market value in one year, which is unheard of by a, a food, a large food company. And we had uh, a very toxic work environment as business had fallen apart for a variety of reasons. Uh, employees were very disaffected, and I was challenged to come in and rebuild, make sure we had the right strategy, and rebuild the organization uh, top to bottom, which is what we did. As we did that, touch points became an obvious, critical part of what I had to do. I had to reconnect people to this notion that as a community, we could do something special. We could focus on winning in the marketplace, but also creating a winning workplace where they could thrive and prosper. And uh, and as a result, over a decade, we went, we dramatically improved our marketplace performance, but more importantly, we created a 
highly engaged culture where every employee felt valued and uh, challenged to do their best work, and they felt as if the people of the company had their back. And not a better not a better feeling when you're working in a tough environment is is to feel like you're not going it alone. And and just to get a little background on Campbell's, how many employees? And I'm curious, was that workforce unionized? Probably unionized, I assume, right? Well, if we have 20,000 employees globally. There were pockets of union activity, but by and large, uh, no, we weren't heavily unionized. And we were focused on, uh, on meeting the needs of our employees to, to such an extent that they never felt the need to unionize. And, and by and large, we did that. But we did have some union activity, and we, and we navigated through that uh, typically uh, pretty effectively in my decade there. And you say that touch points is really, you know, that, by the way, the subtitle of the book is Creating Powerful Leadership Connections in the Smallest of Moments. And you say that it's a, it's a blinding glimpse of the obvious, but maybe not really that obvious, is it? Uh, well, no. You know, we, today, uh, most employees, most people in general, uh, feel as if they're getting a sip of water from the fire hydrant of life. They're having 200 to 400 interactions a day either via email, Twitter, text messaging, phone calls, people stopping by their office, and the list goes on and on and on. And as a result, they, they, they struggle with, well, how do I navigate this crazy life? And that's a good question. And so as I go around the country, this issue is, seems to be the biggest issue of the day in most corporate cultures, and, for, and quite honestly, in, in the nonprofit and the federal uh, government sector, too, where these people are overwhelmed with all these interactions. And so what we've tried to do with touch points is say, don't think of the 400 interactions you have. Think of the next interaction you have. And how can you be more effective in the moment they are so effective that you're able to be more efficient with it as well and more helpful to the other person? So uh, we created this notion of touch points. And uh, we said, you know, there's three things you need to do. You need to listen intently to what's coming at you in the moment. You need to make sure you can understand the context of that decision. And then you need to help the person advance it. So we taught, challenge people to bring a how can I help mentality to the work, listen carefully, frame the issue and advance it. Listen, frame, advance, listen, frame, advance. And then when the, when the interaction's over, you say, how did it go? And what we have found is when people just focus on the moment and try and be helpful in an earnest way, they can uh, get traction with their life again, and they get traction with their coworkers. We have found that if you can just advance three to five more interactions in a significantly more healthy way today than you did yesterday out of the 200 to 400 you have, three to five more interactions managed in a more healthy way, you can change your contribution profile in your place of work or at home. And, uh, and that's what we encourage people to do, to take this simple approach and apply it every day in a disciplined way. And, and they can start to lead a much more fulfilling life. One of the phrases you just mentioned, just even having that phrase occur to one, oneself is, is, is probably a, a huge step forward. And it, it, the phrase is contribution profile. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all about uh, how, how can I help. If you were to go to my website, opponentleadership.com, I've profiled, I just picked 10 touch points in my life where somebody said the right thing the right way at just the right time, and I carry it with me today. In fact, of all the education I've had in college, graduate school, continuing education courses, they've been wonderful, and I'm a better person for it. But quite frankly, those 10 touch points, which when I add it all up take, and I say all the words together, it's about 40 seconds or it's about six words at touch point. Those small touch points can help. They, are, they actually guide my life. One of those touch points was only four words. How can I help? It occurred to me when I was fired from a job and the outplacement guy, every time he answered the phone, he would say, hello, this is Neil McKenna. How can I help? And to, since that day, which was, gosh, it was 27 years ago, I have gone into every interaction saying, in my, in my mind, saying, hello, I'm Doug Conan, how can I help? How can I contribute? And the more I focused on uh, raising my contribution profile, 
the more I've flourished in my work experience. And so I just encourage other people to try to do the same thing. Yeah, well, that's uh, those are that's a great question to ask. You know, it's a great context to just come from that point of view of the how can I help point of view. Can you give us any examples of you know maybe an interaction where someone might do this and increase their contribution profile? And and and, and you know, Doug, when you mentioned that, when you were talking about that, it, it made me think of a few key words in in relationships that I have and how literally even a a, a text message to someone saying the right thing at the ostensibly right time makes a whole difference in the relationship or the friendship for years to come. It's it's incredible. Yeah, Jason, it's an amazing thing. The best way for people to grasp the concept is is that when, when when I'm speaking with an audience, we get to a point very early in the presentation where I, I just ask them to close their eyes and think about someone who's had a profound influence on them in their life, a teacher, a coach, uh, occasionally a boss, typically it isn't, a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, or a good friend. And I ask them to close their eyes and imagine that that person is sitting there with them now. And then I ask them to think about a moment where that person was totally there for them, where they were listening carefully to what was going on, and they were totally there for them, and they found a way to say just the right thing in just the right way at just the right time. And then I encourage the people in the audience to turn to the person next to them and share that experience with them. And then they, I encourage the other person to share back. It takes about two minutes. Everyone has a story about, for example, my story about how can I help. And I'm sure you have your story. Everybody has a story. And, and then I challenge these people. I say, now you, that is the essence of touch points. And my challenge to you is to try and be that person for the people with whom you live and work. And as people reflect on that, they get it. And they get it in the marrow of their bones because they've lived it. They've had people that have had that kind of profound impact on them in small moments, not big, long lectures. None of us, I, most of us don't have those kind of experiences get great traction in our lives. It's those people that were there for us and said just the right thing at just the right time in just the right way. And I just challenge people to be more like that with the people with whom you live and work. And you don't need to go any further than that. They get it. And then the challenge is to bring the discipline to it, to, to try and behave that way a little more today than you did yesterday. You don't have to get all the way to bright. But you do have to do a little better today than you did yesterday. Just that that constant progress, that movement in the right direction can make such a difference. Do you profile in the book any sample interactions? Like, it, it would be good to sort of compare the wrong way to do it and the right way to do it type of thing. If you can, I know I'm probably putting you on the spot, so I apologize. Oh, no. uh, uh, but, but, you know, if you can think of an example, I think it would be helpful for the listeners. I can, uh, I have, uh, of the 10 that I have that are sampled in my... Uh, in one of my videos at my website at conantleadership.com, one, uh, one of them was a horrible example. Uh, I mean, was a negative experience. All touch points are not positive experiences. In one case, I, I went into work one day. I'd been working for this company for nearly 10 years, and uh, the acting vice president of marketing had me come to his office when I came to work that day, and uh, he said, uh, your job has been eliminated. You need to be out of here by noon. And he couldn't look me in the eye, and uh, uh, and I here here you know I had nearly ten years of my career was over in a snap, and I had to go home to my wife, my two small children, my one very large mortgage, feeling every bit the victim, and in that moment, I was devastated and I was bitter, and that was a negative touch point. That same day. I was sent to an outplacement counselor who I at first said, I'm not going to go see him. I was so angry. But then I called him later in the day because I realized I was really having trouble processing all this. And it was, and it was my friend, Neil McKenna, a guy who went on to become my friend, uh, who said, Neil McKenna, how can I help? Come right over. I want to hear all about it. Let's get to work on this right away. And I had one of the best experiences of my life. The same day, I had one of the worst experiences of my career. Those were two touch points. The first touch point has influenced how I've dealt with people in difficult situations for the balance of my lifetime, where I have said, I will never treat anyone as as poorly as I felt treated in that moment. 
and it, it, it has guided me in a direction of being more thoughtful, still being tough-minded on issues, but tender-hearted with people. And then the second interaction with Neil McKenna, has, has, as I've shared earlier in this conversation, has influenced how I try and bring a how-can-I-help attitude to everything I do. So those are two small interactions that I had with others. One was negative, one was positive, that have been, had a guiding influence in my life. Very good. Yeah, very good now, points. Just, and, just and, and things that you'll that, remember, yeah. As a CEO, I was always looking for how can I connect with people in a positive way uh, and reinforce things that were, they're doing right. Because in corporate cultures, you're pretty much trained to find everything wrong. I can find a busted number in a spreadsheet uh, like, uh, like no one else. But, you know, uh, we need to also celebrate what's going right. So every day when I was CEO of Campbell, uh, virtually every day, I would write 10 to 20 handwritten thank you notes, uh, no more than 50 words typically, to employees all around the world who, who had done something right, who had delivered a project on time and on budget, or who had done some extraordinary thing when, when we had the Japanese tsunami or the tsunami in the Philippines, or whatever it was. And, and so I would send out six days a week, 10 to 20 notes over 10 years. When I retired, we added all the notes up. And it turned out I'd sent over 30,000 notes to employees, and we only had 20,000 employees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you but touched I them had, more than once. <laughs> I had touched them in a personal way. It was handwritten. I didn't want them thinking some CEO was having somebody email them for him. And, uh, and I guess the postscript to that, and, and people felt like I was connecting with them. I was paying attention. I was reinforcing the behaviors that we were looking to get in the company in terms of performance. They were not gratuitous notes, but they were saying, look, we're paying attention. We value what you're doing. The more I leaned into that, the, the more I saw employees lean into their work and, and feel as if they were valued. So, uh, that, that was a simple way that I created touch, positive touch points to counterbalance all the other stuff we had to do, which was make a lot of tough calls. So that's a, that's a great touch point. I mean, that isn't very scalable, but it is very cumulative. So very powerful, obviously, handwritten notes, et cetera. But what are some of the touch... I mean, you know, at times, Doug, you've definitely got to use touch points in a mass media format. I mean, CEOs have to do that. Media personalities have to do it. Politicians have to do it. Do you have any advice for mass media touch points? Even if it's someone holding a sales meeting for 10 employees, it doesn't have to be a a, a giant corporate leader or political or celebrity figure, but just a a touch point when it's not one-on-one. Well, I have some some, some, uh, guiding thoughts on that. And I guess the most, uh, most, I hear a couple of them. The first of all, make it personal. If you want people to take that work personally, and really lean into the work, they need to believe that they're connecting with you in a more personal way. So in whatever communication you choose to have, whatever format it is, in fact, the more you have to lean into social media formats, the more you have to be ever more thoughtful about how you can make it personal. The second thing is that uh, people can smell a rat a mile away. Don't play games. You have to show up in an authentic way as well as a personal way. And if you want to have credibility over time, people have to believe that what you see is what you get and that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. So uh, you have to show up with great authenticity. If you, if, you, uh, if, if you make it personal and you show up with great authenticity, you, those are kind of the, those are the dues to get into the game. I mean, that's the ante. Then you have to show up with confidence. Uh, if you really want to have influence with people over time, they have to believe that you know what you're doing. You know, when my wife was in theater years ago, and uh, she, if you're in theater, you work nights and weekends when other people aren't working. So I would come home and have to help out with our children, uh, and I'd have to cook dinner. Now, they thought I was a person that, of good character, and, you know, and I was a pretty good father, but they did know that I could cook with a hoot. So I, they couldn't count on me for dinner. I didn't have a lot of credibility there. So uh, it was a reminder to me that you gotta, if you really want to have influence with people and you want to inspire confidence, you have to have two things. You have to have character. You have to show up in a personal and authentic way, but you also have to know what you're doing. 
And if you don't, you have to acknowledge that. Right, right. So as a leader, those are the things you need to bring to the party if you want to start to have impact with people in the moment through touch points. You have to show up in a truly authentic way, and you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, character trust and competence trust, both of those are so, so important. Are, Are there any examples that you can think of in the mass media world from leaders in whatever position, you know, media life, political life, corporate life, that have, in a speech, for example, successfully used touch points in a, in a positive way and, and really connected and inspired their audience? Well, in, in my lifetime, we had one particular president who was good at connecting with people, and, 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 and there, were, there's a, there were a group of people that called him the great communicator. Yes, good old that Ronnie. Was Ronald, <laughs> the Ron, Gipper, Ronald yeah. Reagan, mm-hmm. who could connect with people in a deeply personal way. Uh, he had enormous credibility with the everyday man and woman. He, he brought he brought the conversation down to a level that was approachable by those people. He showed up in an authentic way. And by and large, he led a life where he did what he said he was going to do. And uh, those are simple rules to live by. But those that's the cost of doing business today. We have a very jaundiced, jaded perspective of leaders today. And I think the challenge for leaders today is to show up in a truly authentic way and to uh, and 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 Ronald Reagan would be the the guy I would go to, who who touched people in a way uh, that I haven't seen many other political leaders, uh, quite frankly, before or since connect with. To me, he was the gold standard when it came to mass media. And I and I couldn't agree more. When I listen to his speeches, I I literally sometimes get goosebumps. I mean, there, he's such an effective communicator. And I'd say that, you know, it's before my time, but, but Jack Kennedy also was quite inspiring like that. And so you've got both sides of the aisle there. <laughs> Just yeah, for well, a little equal true. time. Actually, I thought Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy to me, was showing up in a more authentic way. Jack was, because I grew up then, was was incredibly inspiring, and we were going to go to the moon, and we were going to do extraordinary things. Bobby Kennedy, uh, to me, was touching people in a much more personal and earnest way. He was, he he, in my opinion, he was an amazing communicator. So it, it's not about political parties; it's about uh, it's about uh, authenticity and doing it in a way that connects with the hearts and minds of people. In our book on touch points, we say you've got to do three things. You've know, got to connect with the head and the heart, and you've got to use your hands in terms of developing the practices to be more effective over time. So it's head, heart, and hands. Uh, and if you can do that on all three dimensions, you can connect with people in a meaningful way. Sure, sure. And, you know, I'd, I'd, just one more thing on the political spectrum. So many people say that Clinton was very effective like that, and I never saw it in Clinton. I just didn't get the the greatness of Clinton's charisma that some people comment on. Would love your feedback on that. I, I just never saw it in him like everybody else. Well, I, 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 you know, I, I don't piss just on people. He was clearly highly effective with a lot of people who found his earnest approach to conversation, it resonated with them. And, and he, you know, he clearly did connect with people. I mean, he was elected twice, and he had an approval rating that was extraordinary. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, you know uh, I, it would be hard to argue with. Him. Yeah, well, well, I know. And, you know, I, I have friends who have met him who are critical of him and don't like him politically, but say, you know, you meet that guy in person, and he's, he's just... He's just a likable guy. So obviously something was working there. I guess I kind of missed that one. But, but you know, when you dissect these great, great communicators, uh, going back to Reagan, any, any thoughts on how Reagan did it? I mean, I think he appeared to be a common, very relatable person. He used metaphor and, and visuals. Humor, certainly humor, but humor seems to be a thing that is not available to everybody. <laughs> you know, I just, some people have it and some don't when it comes to humor, at least as far as I can see. But hu- humor is a very good technique to open doors and create touch points, isn't it? Well, I, I, I would connect it back to our touch point model. When, 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 and uh, we'll use Reagan as the example. You felt as if Reagan would come into every moment with this I want to be helpful kind of mindset. How can I help? And people felt heard by him. He, they, they, he would listen intently, and then he would frame issues in a way that made, that people said, okay, you get it, 
And then he just tried to make things a little better today than he did yesterday. And uh, Ronald Reagan, I would argue, had a wonderful continuous improvement mindset with, with, with a very aspirational model for how the world could be. He was just trying to be helpful every day. And my observation is that was somewhat unmistakable. And, and people kind of looked at him in general saying, what you see is what you get. We've got a, just a regular guy who's listening to us who is, is showing that he understands the issues that we feel are important, and he's trying to make things a little better today, and uh, he's with us. And I found that applying the same listen frame advanced mindset and, and, and bringing a how-can-I-help mentality to the work, uh, Ronald Reagan was incredibly effective. I also saw that, quite frankly, with FDR, and, and we can go beyond that. You can also find that with Gandhi and Mother Teresa and uh, a variety of other leaders around the world. They all bring a how-can-I-help mindset to the work that, that people grasp. They all are, wo- they are, are wonderful listeners. They make sure they understand the issue, and they just try and advance things in a way that works for them and, uh, authentically. And so uh, I think it's a simple model. It's not a new model, but it's this notion of how can I help listen, frame, advance, and then ask yourself, how did it go? And try and do a little better today than you did yesterday. And in today's chaotic times, I think it's easier to go back to things that are elegantly uh, simple and get to the far side of complexity and get to things that are approachable and, and, and you can actually bring to life in your everyday life. And that's the power of touch points. Yeah, very, very, very important. Most definitely very important. And, you know, if you look at that in the high-tech world, certainly Apple has brought simplicity. And I think people are craving that kind of simplicity and that high-touch High touch thinking, no, no question about it. Well, the website is conantleadership.com. Of course, Doug, the book is available in all the usual places. I'm sure, right? Yes, absolutely. Amazon, anywhere, anywhere you you know, you can't miss it. And we also provide information on the website. And New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. Good work. I think it's high time that the marketplace have have a, a book like Touch Points. And anything else you'd like to say in closing? No, I, I guess the observation. Oh, yes, there is. I guess my observation is that we can all do better. And if we want to have a better world, uh, we all have to lean into that notion. And we all have to try and do a little better today than we did yesterday in terms of working shoulder to shoulder with the people in our work community and our lives to, to, to make things a little better. If we bring that continuous improvement mindset to the work with this notion of, you know, we can do better, in my opinion, we will. Fantastic. Well, Doug Conant, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, and best of luck to you, Jason. Thank you very much. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Home Study Course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. Thank you for joining us today for the Holistic Survival Show, protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Be sure to listen to our Creating Wealth Show, which focuses on exploiting the financial and wealth creation opportunities in today's economy. Learn more at www.jasonhartman.com or search Jason Hartman on iTunes. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, offering very general guidelines and information. Opinions of guests are their own, and none of the content should be considered individual advice. If you require personalized advice, please consult an appropriate professional. Information deemed reliable, but not guaranteed.